Uh, what I'd like to have is a show of hands. How many of you have at least once been in a very serious religious argument with someone? <laughs> okay, here's the second question. How many of you have won a, a religious argument? How many of you have lost a religious argument? Oh, a couple. <laughs> OK. I want you to keep that in mind uh, in the background, because we'll come back to that, to the notion that there's something uh, deeply provocative about religion. And it's not, uh, it, it's, a, it's a serious matter. It's something that deserves looking into. I would like to uh, begin by uh, putting up a kind of definition that I can make use, use of on the way through these remarks, uh, the definition of ignorance. I see ignorance as having at least uh, three kinds of, uh, three functions. There's ordinary ignorance, which means there's something we don't know and can learn about. There, something's going to happen tomorrow, we don't know what yet. There are many facts that are not immediately available to us and so on. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the supply of objects, of, of facts that we don't know is just uh, indefinite. It's enormous. It's, it's infinite. The second kind of ignorance is uh, a little more elusive. I call it willful ignorance. And by willful ignorance, what I mean is something you know is the case, but you intentionally fog your mind or deny it or set it aside and go on with your activity. For example, uh, and I'll come back probably to use this example a little later, uh, people who deny global warming. I mean, the evidence is awesome on one side. And the only way you can really deny this is to uh, be willfully ignorant of all the work that's done on it. Uh, also, in the, the whole area of evolutionary studies, the, the people, the creationists, uh, have to know that there's an enormous body of literature out there and scholarship, uh, years and years, decades of scholarship on the subject of evolution. And to, to uh, I mean, I know people, I know a couple, both of whom have graduated from college, who still believe that Adam and Eve, there were, that there were dinosaurs in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago. Uh, and there are people, but this requires a lot of willful ignorance. Now, there's a, there's a third category of ignorance that, that is much more complicated, a little subtler than the other two. Ordinary ignorance willful ignorance, and then what I call higher ignorance. And what I mean by higher ignorance, it's a term, uh, it's a concept, really, that I've, I've borrowed from uh, medieval uh, mystics. Primarily, uh, uh, Meister Eckhart, who's a great, great Christian mystic. The idea comes, has a long uh, intellectual background. It begins even... Uh, Is anyone? <laughs> I, I, I hate to do something to us here. So, so, so anyway, uh, we, we go back to Plato uh, and come through a, a philosopher named uh, Plotinus uh, on up through a tradition into the Middle Ages to a philosopher named Nicholas of Cusa. Now, Nicholas of Cusa had the notion that he borrowed really almost directly from Plotinus, that, that reality is singular, that all things constitute uh, a, a giant, enormous, but single whole. What that means is everything we know within that, no matter how many things we do know, does not, make it, uh, make, does not allow us to say something about the whole. 
we can have an enormous number of facts about what's on the inside of this, but we can't step outside and look at it simply because if we do, it's not the one anymore, it's two. So, so we, are, we are actually caught within this, uh, this, this very grand circle, and it's what the mystics consider to be a higher ignorance. It's an ignorance you're very much aware of, you know you will never exhaust, and that lies behind all of your deepest thoughts. So let, let's, um, I'm going to leave that definition in the background while I look at some of the aspects of belief first. I'm going to talk about belief first. Then I want to make a contrast between uh, belief and uh, intellectual inquiry, critical inquiry, and then weave that into a, a, a brief discussion of religion. It's important to think of belief as, as being uh, systems. Oh, by the way, what, what I should point out is that the belief I'm interested in here is not the ordinary kind of believing, well, I, I, I believe that uh, you know, it's getting late in the day and I've got to do something like that. I believe that person isn't quite is saying quite what she or he thinks uh, I, uh, is actually saying and so on. Uh, Belie the kind of belief I'm interested in is a belief of very great intensity. And it doesn't necessarily, uh, it, it, the intensity is more important than the content of the belief. So I, I want to set up a scale in, in such a way that what we're talking about is what I would like to call true belief. as the kind of belief you'd be willing to die for or even worse, kill for. So we, and, and the reason I want to talk about that kind of belief is that that uh, intense believing, that so-called true belief, is, is really a great danger to the world at the moment. Well, it's always been a great danger to the world, but right now uh, it's, we're seriously endangered by true believers. Uh, we've come off a century in which true believers have done unbelievable you know, un unimaginable, I should say, uh, uh, damage. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, uh, that moment, uh, that point a little later. So the, uh, we're going to talk about true belief, the beliefs you would, you would die for or kill for. In the year 1517, Martin Luther, who was a, a young monk uh, living in... Uh, teaching in Germany, he was at the University of Wittenberg, uh, as much of you uh, know, I'm sure, nailed 95 theses to the door at the Cathedral of Wittenberg, uh, essentially uh, uh, pointing out that the, 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 the basic argument is that the Pope has no biblical basis for uh, holding his office. And it was a direct attack on the authority of the church. It was a most provocative act. And because the, uh, the, the uh, printing press had been invented just a decade or two before that, a couple decades before, it allowed the fact that these 95 theses were very easily distributed uh, all over Europe. It's one of the first really uh, mass publications of any provocative kind uh, in the history of the printing press. By, by 1521, uh, Luther's outrageous uh, provocation of the church had become such a big cause across Europe that naturally the emperor, who happened to be the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, uh, saw a great danger to uh, the a division of his empire. He, of course, was opposed to Luther. He called Luther to the uh, cathedral at Worms, Worms in Germany in the year 1521. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Worms, make that an F. Uh, 1521, uh, to be tried by his ablest theologians and to uh, show that his teachings were uh, uh, unorthodox, heterodox. Uh, Luther appeared. Now, the, uh, the drama of the situation could hardly be exaggerated. We know 
there's, a, there's a familiar painting of Luther uh, where he's, he's, he's an older man. He's got big, heavy jowls and, and, and so on. Looks like a big, substantial human being. The truth is that he weighed about 90 pounds. He was under five feet. He was a diminutive character. Uh, he, when he showed up at, in Worms at the, at the cathedral, there were about 2,000 of his followers that came with him. He was riding in a little uh, uh, horse cart. Uh, he went into the cathedral alone and uh, faced the, the, the emperor who was there, Emperor Ch uh, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, and his big theologians. They examined him and, of course, found him guilty of heresy. So they demanded that he recant. And what, it's one of the, the, the more famous uh, sort of belief uh, moments in the history of Christianity when Luther, facing all these, uh, these terrifying, full of, the, the cathedral is full of knights and soldiers and so on. Uh, finally, he said, it was a day or two later, he came back and he said, uh, uh, I do not recant. Uh, here I stand is the, is the, the way that it's, um, it's been recorded in history. It's not known that he really said this, uh, but here I stand has become, that phrase has become a kind of model for the, the firm belief that people hold and are willing to die for. He was certainly willing to die for it. He was, uh, he was rescued, though, by... Uh, one of his uh, champions, who happened to be Frederick the Wise, a prince uh, in Germany at the time, and one of his early followers, and he was spirited off to a castle belonging to uh, Frederick the Wise, where he spent a year in hiding from the emperor, who in the meantime was chasing him, trying to, trying to run him down. Now, I use Luther because uh, here we have... Uh, it's a very interesting setting. Luther was a learned fellow. He was a professor of Hebrew. He was a specialist on the Old Testament. His language gifts were enormous. He was, a, he was, a very he was young, but he was very learned. But also the, 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 the court was learned. Charles V's court was extremely learned as well. But they knew the same things. They all studied the same subject. They, they encountered each other, disagreed uh, dramatically, and still found each other uh, guilty of heresy. Of course, uh, Luther was, was excommunicated very quickly. And in his response to his excommunication, he said, he, he demanded sort of typically of Luther, I excommunicate the Pope. That's what he said. <laughs> Uh, I, I think the Pope had, a, had a, uh, a, little, a little more power over Luther at that point. But in any case, what we have is a, is a, is a situation that's, A, very provocative. Luther provoked the Pope. There's no question about it. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a moment of collision between two complete belief systems. Now, I, I use the word belief system. I, I noticed that uh, through the discussion today, actually, uh, Jordan talked about, used the term belief system, I think for the first time in these discussions. Most people have been talking about beliefs, uh, you know, as individual things, as a, as a single propositional statement. A true believer, and, and a, believer, a true believer of any great importance, not only has a belief, but a whole system of beliefs uh, that essentially cover the whole field of, uh, you know, every, uh, it's sort of uh, cover everything. One of the characteristics of a, of, a, of a good belief system is that it's completely comprehensive. It explains everything. It exists within a very sharp boundary. The boundaries all, are all very clear. A true believer always knows where he or she is going to meet the false believer. And that line is drawn with, with great clarity. But notice that the line is where the believer and unbeliever meet. It's a line of opposition, of hostility, of encounter, competition, and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a boundary. And within that boundary are contained 
all of the positions of the true believer and those with whom he holds these beliefs. Now, of course, most belief systems are, are uh, communal. We, we've had that discussion a, uh, a number of times, but it's, it's a good thing to underline that. A lot of the talk that, that has, you know, a lot of our conversation in, the, in these groups, I've noticed, has to do with individual uh, uh, thinking and action. And what I'd like to emphasize is that belief systems are also collaborative, they're, they're uh, communal, and always represent some kind of a, of a body of, uh, of, of persons uh, who are uh, identi closely identified with each other. So we're working within a boundary. And what's, another thing that's interesting about that is that every, because it's a boundary and an and encounter, uh, every, uh, both sides, uh, for both sides, uh, the, the opposite side is always an unbeliever. So on both sides are believers and unbelievers. I mean, the, 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 I, if I... You know, the believer is an unbeliever of that which is on the opposite side. And if you notice, when you talk with believers, they're almost always very well educated on what they're not believing. They can give you a very good account of what's wrong uh, and what, what, what contradicts their own, their own believing. Uh, so that uh, it's, there's a kind of contradiction involved in it, too. You can't be a believer without being an unbeliever. Uh, and there's the, the intensity of the belief requires, in fact, that you have some kind of opposition to yourself. Uh, I believe it was, uh, 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 yeah, you, Jim was talking about, uh, made, made a very nice point uh, about an, uh, arguing with someone uh, who, in a, in a conspiratorial, someone who has a conspiratorial uh, theory, in such a way that every argument you use actually supports their position. Well, this is very much the case with all true believers. Any argument against them looks to them like an argument on their behalf. And so, for that reason, uh, believers tend to provoke those around them uh, into arguments like the ones you, you, you've all had. There's something inherently provocative about religion, about religious belief. Now, another characteristic of a belief system is that uh, the, the boundaries are always drawn for you, not by you. There's always an authority that, that determines where the boundary is and what the contents are. That authority can be consulted, but the authority, the authority speaks to you, not for you, and you are, as a believer, don't really share in that authority except to be obedient to it. And that's an important point that we'll come back to in a moment. So a belief system uh, is comprehensive. It makes a lot of sense. Once you get inside a belief system, everything seems to be rational even. I, 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 a few years ago, well, back when I, when I was teaching, uh, some, some years ago now, many years, I, I took over a class of a, of a colleague of mine who was teaching a history of Christian thought. That was not my field, but I uh, thought, uh, he asked me if I would uh, finish a semester for him. He was, he was sick and had to leave. So I did, and, and then I, I went back to my graduate school notes and decided I would spend some time rereading Thomas Aquinas. Now, Aquinas, uh, who lived in the third, middle of the 13th century, uh, was, became later on the, 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 the philosopher, the theologian, the official theologian of the Catholic Church a decision that was made uh, following, following Luther, actually. But he way preceded Luther by three centuries. But the, his thinking is quite beautiful. It, it was influ influenced by Aristotle. And as I was reading it, I got really taken into it. Again, I thought, wow, this stuff is great. 
So I, I, as I taught it to this class, a fairly large class, uh, I noticed they were getting, uh, more, they were sort of staring at me harder and harder. It didn't occur to me that most of the class was Catholic. And it just, I, I, didn't, I didn't think that at all. And finally, it was, it took the third or fourth day, I noticed that students were sitting there not even putting their pen on the paper. And the reason why, and then I, I thought, something strange is happening here. And what happened is they didn't, the Catholic kids told me later, they had no idea that their beliefs were that beautiful. And they thought everything the priests had been doing, I thought were crazy, make huge sense. It was all rational, gorgeous. I mean, it is. I mean, yeah, any of you who studied uh, Thomas know that it's I mean, a magnificent system. And so uh, these students were really quite taken into it. I thought it was a great example of the way in which a belief system has its own internal uh, uh, consistency and rationality. And it worked, it worked beautifully uh, in this case. Uh, and and most, most often they do. Even, even very crazy systems will, once you're inside, make a great deal of sense. Now, I want to contrast a belief system with what uh, I, I will call uh, a system of inquiry. It, a system of inquiry very often mimics or seems to be like a belief system. It has some of the same characteristics to it. Uh, it's important to remember, let's, uh, we'll take a field, take uh, in, in evolutionary studies. Uh, it's important to remember that it's a system of thought. It's not just a bunch of idle thoughts. They're all connected. It's deeply integrated. Uh, the, it, is, uh, it is voluminous in its quantity, and it's extremely rational, although it's also deeply disputational within. I mean, if you, when you look over uh, uh, an intellectual, uh, take an intellectual uh, quick view of, an evolution, of the evolutionary tradition, and what you find is a very large band of quarreling scientists. They, they very often disagree with each other. But they're all involved in uh, a very large project, larger than, than any of them uh, individually can, can do. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly uh, conversational setting. They're, they're, in, uh, they're in constant dialogue with each other. The, their conclusions are primarily provisional. They're not final. And, and what's more, uh, they, instead of a collision or provocation, uh, they are critical with each other. What critical means is raising questions again and again about the, um, the veracity and the uh, adequacy of, of the thoughts of others and various opponents. Okay. I would use one of these things, but uh, I haven't learned uh, how to do it. And in fact, you know, I date back uh, a, a few years, and it was a tough trip up here, by the way, from uh, New York City, where I, uh, my wife Donna and I came from. Horse and buggy is tough traveling. <laughs> so, um, think, think of a, we'll, we'll just use the, the square again. Uh, that's been used a couple of times in uh, previous discussions. Uh, think of a belief system as, as being, the system itself as being extremely uh, well organized, as I indicated. Uh, and so when you get to, to the boundaries, you know, you stop there. Uh, and and uh, you're not only uh, uh, are, you, are you to stop, but your, your thinking is to stop there also. Now, in a, uh, it's hard to diagram a, the, the uh, a system of, of uh, critical thinking, critical inquiry. But, but when, normally, in a, in a, when, you're in a, when you're a critical thinker, you get to that boundary and you look for every possible opening through it. What you're trying to do is find the holes in the boundary, you're trying to extend it, uh, and so on. So that even though at times it looks like a belief system, 
Uh, it's one in which the dynamic is forever to challenge the uh, outer edges of it. And that's, that's uh, interesting in several ways. A lot of, you know, if you, when you, when you uh, hear people, especially uh, people, uh, well, a good example is the, is the, uh, is, is the uh, theory of evolution, so-called, let's use the so-called creationists, uh, who would like to say that the, argue that the, the account in Genesis has scientific value. Um, they, uh, they, uh, they, what they would like to do is argue with the evolutionary scientists who are often tempted into opposing the creationist uh, belief system. But that's a kind of tactical mistake because the, 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 they're not in a belief system. They're in a mode of inquiry. And the, the two are not in the same category. So you can't, the, the, the creationism is not an opponent of, of evolutionary theory. It's a misunderstanding of what evolutionary theory is all about completely and, and the way you, you go about it. So, so that if you're in a critical, uh, if you're in, in, in the system of critical inquiry, you're always looking for the way out. And the authority is a completely different, uh, has a completely different nature. Within a belief system, the authority is someone you go to uh, to be instructed in what to, te what to think and teach and, and so on. In, uh, in, the, uh, in a system of critical inquiry, you become your own authority. And you go to those who will assist you in arriving at your own thinking. It's a totally different concept of, of authority. I, I like to uh, sort of rewrite the word so that it looks like authorship as much as it does authority. It's, it's a, a kind of an original thinking that uses all of the wisdom, knowledge, and experience of others uh, that's available to them but in the end becomes one's own uh, thinking and for which one is, uh, one, uh, one is uh, completely responsible for oneself. So there's, there's a very, here the, the uh, emphasis is on the inside and here it's uh, trying to get out on the outside. I, I would like to use uh, often in this discussion, kind of a discussion, I like to use the, the distinction between, it's kind of a metaphorical distinction but I think it works well between a boundary, which is absolute, well-defined, everyone knows where the boundary is, and a horizon. Now, a horizon has an odd character. It always, what it means, of course, is the point at which your vision, it really marks the end of, the, of your uh, field of vision. Well, th that's peculiar because if you move, one step or any degree at all, your field of vision changes. And so where if you were to move around inside a, a, a belief system, the boundaries don't change. But when you move around within a horizontal situation, the horizons always expand. So your own, your own experience enlarges, your own knowledge enlarges the field of your vision. And how large can that field of vision get? There's no limit to that. The limit, is the, the, the limit is simply set by your own ability to alter your vision, to deepen your vision, to extend it, and so on. So uh, think of uh, critical inquiry as being uh, a horizontal, not a bounded situation. The word horizontal is a little odd. You don't, I'm not asking you to repeat that word, but just in this, uh, in this discussion. Okay, so what we have so far is a contrast between belief systems and systems of rational inquiry against the definition of ignorance that I began with. Now, note this. Belief systems are 
willful ignorance. Because everyone within the system knows the limits are there. They turn around. They, they, they get to a point. They come back. There's an awareness that you're just believing. Now, uh, a, a very strange thing happened to Luther that, that has enormous historical consequences after that appearance at the, at the uh, Cathedral of Orms. He, uh, he was guaranteed safe travel, safe uh, exit by uh, Charles V, who later regretted it, of course. But he let Luther go. Luther was taken by Frederick the Wise to a little castle of his, like I mentioned, uh, holed up there for uh, a little over a year. In that year, by the way, Luther, which the year was 1521-22, uh, uh, in that year, Luther translated the uh, Bible from Hebrew and Greek into German, uh, making his dialect the official German language. It was accidentally. That was one of the historical outcomes of that. Uh, but uh, during this period, Luther, uh, one night, was visited by, of all people, the devil. And the devil, uh, in the middle of the night, he, he gives a very, very vivid description of it. The devil appeared and, and uh, confronted Luther as he was studying, and the, in the confrontation said, renounce your faith. And Luther, in rage, picked up the ink bottle he was using to translate, <laughs> he was, you know, with his, with his, for his pen, and threw it at the devil. It hit the wall, I missed the devil, I guess, I don't know, but, <laughs> but, but hit the wall and blew around. And when I, when I was a student, well, you could imagine how many years ago that might have been, I, I visited this castle, and a guide took us up into the, 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 uh, the room where Luther did that work. And uh, he said, if you look carefully, you can still see the stain. And I looked so carefully. <laughs> but, but, but I didn't see it. Everyone else saw it but me. But, uh, but anyway, I, I think I was a little relieved that I didn't. Uh, so, so, but Luther wasn't really, in the end, fooled that it was actually the devil. He knew what it was. Namely, it was his own self-doubt. He knew he was being uh, a a, willful, a willfully ignorant believer. He knew he was taking on a belief he didn't really deeply hold. And there was a deep contradiction in himself. Now, I said that's, I made the point that's important historically. But it happens like this. Uh, Luther's doubt then gets built into his thinking, into Protestant thinking, into Protestant theology. It's already affecting uh, John Calvin, who comes ab about a generation after Luther. And it's never really dropped out of, of Protestant uh, theology and philosophy. It comes up in Hegel. You know Hegel's uh, dialectical way of thinking. You always think against yourself uh, and, and uh, hope for a deeper insight for, for having done so. It comes up in uh, Kierkegaard. It comes up in all of the existentialists, particularly uh, Heidegger and Sartre. It comes up in the uh, deconstructionists later on. And some, uh, in some way, not directly, it even affects Freud and Freud's thinking about, about the, the human interiority. So that, that Luther's, Luther, uh, Luther's self how shall I say it? His will, his acknowledged, self-acknowledged willful ignorance, has a very large intellectual uh, outcome in in, uh, in Western thought. Uh, Luther himself, I mean, just just a historical note, uh, didn't make as much of it as he as he could have. I mean, some of his his writings are extraordinary and do reflect it, but then later on he he became rigid. And more like the church, he was rejecting, sort of a dogmatic figure. Uh, he died in uh, 1546, and then uh, the 
a Council of Trent was convened where the Catholics came together, well, I should say the, the Pope and, and uh, his uh, cardinals came together and his scholars. And that's where Protestantism, where, where, where the great division of, of Christianity began, the Council of Trent. Now, from there on, from then on, it was all Protestant or Catholic. Of course, there's an Eastern di division too, but we'll, we'll leave that out for the moment. Now, uh, how does all this have to do with, with uh, religion itself? Again, there's a, there's a, di there's a deep confusion. Most people associate belief with religion. The truth is that these belief systems are just as, uh, uh, just as applicable to uh, the, the, an, uh, an actual, we could, we could, we could uh, uh, make the word ideology does just as well as, uh, as belief system. And we're, you know, as, as I said before, we've come off a, a century where we've, we've been in the arm, the hands of terrible ideologues. I mean, Nazism and uh, uh, Marxism, if we put them together, all the damage that the two of them have done and a number of other isms along the way, and nationalisms and so on, uh, you know, scholars are, putting the total of officially killed people at something like 200 million in the, in the 20th century. These are people who've been killed by, by authentic, justified governments, most of them elected democratically, not all of them. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, uh, the, uh, the, 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 their belief systems uh, just as much as any of the Christian belief systems. But I do have to point this out, that the, the, those, just take Nazism and Marxism, uh, two very, very powerful uh, systems. Uh, you know, when I was a young professor, there were, uh, there were Marxist, uh, there were a number of Marxists on the faculty at New York University where I, I spent my entire career. Uh, and they were really smart people. They were really smart. And they had arguments that would just cut you in half. Uh, and and I, I dreaded those guys. I mean, they, they had all kinds of, uh, I mean, they, they, they were clean, brilliant uh, positions that they, they had. And they, they could assemble an enormous number of, uh, amount of fact to support their Marxist views. And the, the, their, their Marxism got very, very extravagant. I mean, really complicated and big. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, at the same time, we have to look, look back a little bit. But start with Nazism, just a, a moment here. What is the, remember, you, you know the symbol of Nazism, naturally. I'm not even going to write it on the board. It's too ugly. Uh, you know, the, the swastika. You note that, of course, that it's a cross. So, by the way, is the hammer and sickle a cross. Both, I would, what I would like to say is that both Marxism and uh, Nazism are Christian heresies. Outcomes of, they are, they are too close to this aspect of Christianity. I'll be a little more specific. Hegel was the source of Marx's deepest ideas. Marx read Hegel, read, he didn't read enough Hegel, I think, but, but he read enough, uh, he read the introduction at least to the Phenomenology of the Spirit, or the first few pages of the Phenomenology of the Spirit. <laughs> but actually, the first few pages of the Phenomenology of Spirit will, as any philosopher knows, pretty much defeat you anyway. They're very difficult. But in that, he picked up an insight from, from that, uh, from reading the uh, introduction to the, or it wasn't the introduction, the first part of the, of, the, of the phenomenology. Now, Hegel was, an, was a Christian. It was kind of like an uber-Christian. Uh, he thought that the incarnation essentially, the incarnation of Jesus, essentially represented the one, remember I talked about that before, 
the one becoming one again. And he saw it as, as an enormous process that was under its own power. Now, what Marx picked up from it is that, that what Marx saw was that he could ride that power of the, of, of the, the, the evolution of consciousness. I mean, I, I don't want to give you a whole Marxist lecture here. I'd, I'd love to do it, but, uh, but, but it's enough to say that that it comes out of Hegel, who was himself deeply influenced by, by Christians and by Luther, remember. Now, uh, the, Nazi, the Nazi, I, you see, Nazism, is it, I don't even have to make a case for it. It's just an outright Christian crime, Nazism. Uh, the Nazis made use of the uh, German Christian church. Uh, they identified themselves with, uh, with uh, Christians and vice versa. Uh, so that what we have is uh, a, a, a terrific overlap of ideology, uh, ideological systems that are both religious and, and political uh, and ideological, all feeding into each other and so on, and very dangerous. Now, that's why systems of critical inquiry are so important, and they are not willfully ignorant in their ideal form, but they are a function of higher ignorance uh, because they recognize that there is no final answer. Now, re remember uh, John's uh, <laughs> lovely image, I love that, of the circles. Uh, of the framing. Uh, you always need a frame to see what you're seeing. You see it through a frame, but you can also put the frame in a frame, and then you can put that frame in a frame. And then to use John's metaphor, uh, there's a shadow you can't step out of. It's bigger than you. And I think that's, that's the, the point that Nicholas of Cusa was making. You can't get outside it. You can't make a comment about the whole. And I believe that's what uh, systems of inquiry will do if properly conducted. Now, let's, let's leave that from, I'll come back to that, but uh, keep that in mind. I want to talk a little bit about religion. Again, uh, religi John introduced the term religi religio, uh, the Latin term, and, and he was correct. It, it does mean binding together. That's right. Uh, but, but, you know, there's something interesting about that. Um, look at this word. You ever think of that? Uh, in, in uh, you know, as language, it's a, it's a Sanskrit word, yoga. And as Sanskrit moved west uh, through uh, number, a number of languages, the, the G became a K. And the A became an E. Yoke. It's the same, has the same meaning as religio. It's, it's a holding together, a binding together, a putting of parts together. I always rather like that. So, anyway, uh, religio. Now, how do we define religion? It, you know, on one level, it seems fairly simple, and, and we've had a number of definitions. I thought they were pretty good. But, but, but not, not, they didn't quite get there. And I'll tell you why they didn't quite get there. They're, they're correct, but they're in a very, very small frame. And we have to step back and get a bigger frame, and still a bigger frame. Now, what I would like to do, well, first, I'll just make this, this point. It was very popular in the 20th century, sort of the middle, the early, to middle 20th century, even later, uh, to teach a subject called uh, a comparative religion, where you, you, will, you will look at different religions and try to find common elements that will help you understand the phenomenon of religion altogether. I'll just uh, I'll do a shorthand on this one. That project has been abandoned. Uh, no, no respectable scholar any longer will teach a course called comparative religion. Why is that? It's because the comparisons uh, are too 
uh, difficult to uh, ascertain. Uh, who, who is one, one, uh, one of the speakers was talking about this. That once you, well, let me just take, I know, I know what I'll do, just look at one aspect of religion, sort of what looks like a kind of, of a universal feature of religion, namely uh, scripture. Some kind of divine, uh, divinely revealed uh, writing. So, of course, right away we think of the Bible. Someone raised the question about the Bible the other day. There was a little talk about fundamentalism and uh, the Bible. Uh, it's, it's a really very complicated matter. Fundamentalism, let's, let's begin with that, doesn't really emerge until the end of the 19th century. The term fundamentalism didn't exist until then. And it's primarily a response, most people believe, to, uh, of all people, uh, Darwin. And be because uh, Christian theologians are really kind of stumped by, by Darwin's uh, bold theories. Uh, so they, what they began to do is to substitute the, the account in Genesis of the creation of the earth for, or, or see it as a competitive doctrine to Darwin. Well, uh, that, of course, again, they're true believers. They, they developed it. It became so more and more complicated. And now what we have in, in sort of contemporary fund, uh, fundamentalism is, is a notion that you can read the page right off and, and uh, take it into yourself as, as coming directly from God. Well, this is an innovation, actually, in the Christian tradition. Uh, to, to begin with, uh, when we look at Scripture, uh, just let me go through this for a, a little bit here. When we look at Scripture, it's, it has many different sources. Uh, the, the, the Bible uh, is made up of, 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 all, of different genres of, of literature. Uh, almost all of the Bible is of unknown origin. We know the names of the, of the writers who, uh, for example, wrote the Gospels, but that's all we know, their names. We know nothing about them. We know a few things, namely that none of them actually spoke Hebrew uh, or, or, uh, or much less Aramaic, which was Jesus' language, uh, and so on. I, I mean, go on for a while about this. Uh, so then what happened is that the Bible really wasn't accepted as a Bible until about the fourth century. And uh, even the gospel, the, the, the New Testament, wasn't arranged until about that time. So it comes late in Christian history. And in the, uh, in the, in the intervening years, the, the church, the Catholic, what we now call the Catholic Church, pretty much took the Bible as secondary to its own teaching. The church saw itself as a, a literal historical extension of the incarnation. Uh, that's prior to scripture. Now, it was Luther who came along and said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. The scripture is prior to the Pope. That comes first. And that was the message of the 95 Theses. And, and then Luther said, because it comes before the Pope, we read it with our own authority. Well, reading the scripture with your own authority means an array of meanings that's just dizzying in their extent. And so right after Luther, there was a whole wave of very odd movements and so on, uh, 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 called, referred by scholars, referred to by scholars as the Radical Reformation. Uh, there are a few surviving groups. Uh, Quakers came out of it. Uh, the Shakers, but of course they're gone, and a few other, uh, uh, few other groups that came out of that radical period, all of them reading the Bible in their own, in their own way. Now, uh, so that the Bible, even the Bibles are very difficult. I mean, it just has all kinds of different ways of being read and un understood. And then you look at other literature, for example, the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, well, it's impossible to separate the Hebrew scriptures from the Talmud, which, which really is a long series of discussions uh, among Jewish scholars about the, the, the law and the, other, and the prophets of the, of the Hebrew scriptures. Those are written down 
and those, uh, and they're very, there's very large volumes, and those are being studied and added to over the years. It's an ongoing conversation. There's nothing fundamentalist about it. Now, then you look at the Quran, uh, and the Quran is a very different document. It's not like the Bible at all. In the first place, the Quran, as Muslims like to talk about, is what is, is a recitation, as they use it. What, what, what Muhammad did, receiving the, the, the scripture direct from God through the angel, uh, was to recite it to his wife. He was known to be uh, illiterate. Uh, and to other friends who collected these, these visions that he had, that he was getting nightly, uh, they accumulated over the years. It was not a single document, written on all kinds of materials. And it was, it was a good century or so before they were able to gather this together uh, into a final document. And the final document, the Quran as we know it, may not be translated from Arabic. It's not valid if it's translated. And the basic approach to the study of the Quran is to recite it. It's a recitation to do what Muhammad did when he received it. So that's why in, in, uh, in Islam, there's not what we would call anything like biblical scholarship. The scholarship by very, very learned pe uh, uh, people in, in, the, in uh, Islam is, is of a very different kind than, than we would call biblical scholarship. It's mostly... Uh, it, it really centers, again, on recitation and knowing the content very, very well. And, of course, some of them are extraordinary at it. And then, you, you know, you, we go across the, the, the other religions. We get Vedas uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Hinduism. They're very, very different from anything in, in Western religions. And by the, word, the, 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 by the way, the word Veda, too, becomes interesting. The V becomes a W. The E becomes an I, and the D becomes a T, and uh, Veda becomes the, 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 uh, becomes the Sanskrit uh, root for wisdom, intelligence, wisdom, insight. And then the, uh, in Buddhism, we have the sutras, and the sutras are really sayings. They're not exactly scripture. They don't have... They don't have any kind of institutional authority and so on. So if we, if we try to find some similarity of, among all the religions of the world, uh, scripture won't do it. That won't do it. What about priesthood? Same story. Uh, the, the variations are enormous. Now let's, let's just for a moment uh, try run one religion. Let's try uh, Christianity. See what we can make of that. Uh, and I'll do, I'll do this very quickly. Um, Jesus uh, was uh, illiterate, probably. We don't know that he ever read anything or wrote anything. Uh, his ministry was probably one year. He was probably 29 or 30 years old. He was homeless. Uh, that's all we know of him. Except from, from, and he was, in other words, he was, his life was very brief, he was a very simple person, and that was it. Now we have the scripture instead. Now it would be, it would seem to most people simple to go to the Gospels and write down what Jesus said and sort of put it out as the teachings of Jesus. I can't tell you how many efforts have been made to write down sensibly the teachings of Jesus. Thousands, thousands, and libraries all over the world. And basically, no one agrees. And the life of Jesus is even more confusing. So many books have been written about the life of Jesus that, that, you, <laughs> that, that you, no library could hold them, uh, in fact. Uh, the, um, uh, at, at the end of the 19th there was a, there was a big movement among French and German scholars in the, in the sort of late 19th century, mid, mid to late 19th century, 
uh, called by the German name the Leben Jesu movement or the Life of Jesus movement, where very learned scholars, people who really knew the languages very well, uh, were trying to put down a consecutive, uh, coherent story of the life of Jesus. Then Albert Schweitzer, a name known probably to, to most of you, a great, great figure uh, of, of many, many ways, of quite a remarkable human being, uh, wrote a very famous book uh, published in 1903. What he did was to summarize all of the, 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 the lives of Jesus that were written in that period, concluded when you put all those lives together by all those scholars, with all those linguistic and historical gifts, he concluded they make no sense. Jesus is as strange to us. This is the last line of his, of his great book, which was called The Quest for the Historical Jesus. Jesus is as strange to us as he was to the disciples who met him at the edge of the Sea of Galilee. We have no idea who he was. Now the question is, why don't we shut up? <laughs> Isn't that enough about this poor guy? You know, the, the, uh, the, uh, what, what I like to point out is that the books about Jesus, the Jesus is by far the most written about human being who ever lived, by far. No one's even close. And, by, and I would even go farther. I'd say he is the most, the best known name of any human being ever born on earth. Every Christian knows there are two billion Christians. Every Muslim knows uh, the name of Jesus because he's, he's the fifth of the six uh, prophets of, of Islam. And uh, so that represents more than half the world, those, those two groups. Uh, he's the best known name on, on who, of anyone who ever lived and the least understood person of all. Now, uh, just to give you one more uh, little fact, a little doozy, uh, there is a, a, a group called the Society of Biblical Literature that, that studies the the, the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. To be a member of the Society for Biblical Literature, you have to have a PhD, you have to have written a dissertation that's absolutely original, that copies no one preceding you, that probably upsets a whole lot of other studies. Uh, and, uh, and if you do that successfully, you can be, uh, uh, become a member of the uh, of the SBL, the Society for Biblical Literature. How many members are there? About 15,000. Think of all those books about all that scripture, not one agreeing with another. In other words, we're talking about enormous, uh, you know, just huge bodies. Of, religion is a very, very big thing. And then you think of all the, uh, the literature that's come after it and so on. I, I was going through a library a few years ago, and I, I passed a, a shelf where the writings of a guy named Karl Barth were collected. Uh, Barth is, uh, B-A-R-T-H, is a Swiss theologian, uh, wrote in the, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, and a towering mind, a great, a great intellect, enormously competent uh, scholar, and uh, when, I was, when I was studying, when I was in graduate school, people were reading them all. I, I read them, too. I read some, some of this stuff. So I, I was walking by there. Here were all the works of, of Karl Barth on the shelf. I thought, hmm, let's, let, me, let me see. I counted them up, and I forget how many volumes there were. But then I, I did a kind of a, uh, maybe a childish thing. I, I totaled the pages. Uh, and, and then I figured out the words. It comes to over two million words, about 500 times the length of the New Testament. In other words, one scholar at the end of the one century, one scholar among many writing about that material, and by that time there is so much of that material that no one could possibly comprehend it all. Now, now there, there are a couple of things I, want to, I just want to say, and then, then I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got this huge, huge body of literature, but that's also true for the other religions. 
uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Judaism, and so on, all have enormous uh, literatures. They've been around for a long time. Now, how do we define a religion that is that big, that complicated, when we can't even define one of them? I mean, Christians can't even decide what Christianity is about. So here's, here's the only thing I can suggest. We have to realize, we have to accept the fact of their longevity. Hinduism has been around uh, from uh, I, I, approximately 4,000 years, easily dated 4,000 years ago. Buddhism, 2,500 years ago. Uh, Christianity, 2,000. Judaism, probably, uh, I don't know, you, you could, maybe 2,000, maybe 3,000. Uh, Islam, uh, easily 14, uh, 1,400 uh, years, 14 centuries, their longevity. Now, the most interesting thing about that longevity is that a lot of these religions overlapped each other. For example, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism overlapped each other in India for about 1,000 years. And, and they borrowed each other's terminology, their, their symbology, their language, and, and so on. But never were they confused about who they were. No Hindu woke up in the morning and thought, am I a Buddhist or a Hindu? There was something about Hinduism and something about Buddhism that wouldn't yield to the other. Christians, Muslims, and Jews lived together in Europe, worked, talked to each other, read each other's languages, influenced each other, and so on. Not once is there a Jew who thought he was a Christian or a Christian who thought he was a Muslim and so on. I mean, it might have a few oddballs, but, but for the most part, it was so rare, it's never been recorded. So what we have is a huge body of literature, thought, and practice that uh, has been in existence for centuries that will not compromise with any of the other movements, no matter how intimate they overlap. In other words, each of these has an identity. Uh, that is not to be compromised. Now, what is that identity? Well, here's, here's, here's the tempting thing. You want to say, okay, here's where God gets into the picture or, or some, some kind of supernatural thing. But the truth is that in each of these traditions, everyone's trying to figure out what that identity is there. So Christians can't decide what holds Christianity together. But now the next important thing to realize they can't stop talking about it. They just are obsessed. They keep asking, they're provoked over and over and over again to find out who Jesus is, what he was up to, and so on. They just won't forget it. So my, my formulation is that, I mean, it seems obvious to me, there's something there that draws us on, causes the arguments uh, that can't be solved, but nonetheless don't go away. I have no idea what that is. I don't say, I, I really don't know what it is. I don't pretend to know what it is. I don't think it's particularly religious. I don't know what it, you know, even that I don't know. All I know is that that identity exists. It keeps drawing attention to itself and also defying definition. I think that the, my, my own feeling is that uh, so where does belief come into this? I think that because of that mystery at the core of those religious traditions, that mystery is so enveloping, powerful, and disturbing, and infuriating, really, that it's easy, that, that it, attra it, it attracts people into creating belief systems that will account for it. So religion creates belief systems because it cannot be understood not because they're religious, but because religion is in its core a mystery. Belief systems are then a reaction of terror or anxiety or something to the deepest insights of religion. And that's why I, I want to say that I don't want to make a case for religion, really. I, I, I'm not sure it's a good thing. I can only tell you from a scholarly point of view, it's a very big thing, it's a very long thing, uh, it's a very mysterious thing. Whether it's good, I don't know. I mean, I, 
I'll, I'll reserve that, 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 that question. So the, um, the title of this talk, if, if you recall, I, I, I remember. <laughs> I, I, ho I hope I remember. Uh, the title of the talk is, Where is the Truth in True Belief? It's not in belief. And it's not in religion. Uh, it's beyond both. Aristotle uh, said, very, one of his famous remarks, Aristotle said, uh, philosophy begins in wonder. What I would like to say is the study of religion and philosophy begins in wonder and also ends in wonder. Uh, thank you. Sure. That was a wonderful talk. We have some time for questions. We're going to have maybe about 15 minutes for Q&A. So again, uh, we have uh, be set up and uh, start over on this side. Hello. Um, Do we my... have anybody who's not yet asked a question? Could we start with uh, uh, an original? Just. just... <laughs> I, I don't, I didn't mean, you know, uh, uh, some people have been asking a lot of questions. They're very good questions, but I thought there might be some people out there who have yet to uh, uh, raise. Yeah, no, I guess not. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. I, don't think. I was wondering um, if you had any advice, like normative statements instead of just facts, on how to avoid being a fundamentalist, because I think even smart people can fall into a, a belief system if they're um, not always critical. Like, for example, during the summer vacations, I sort of fall into different sorts of belief systems, and it's only when I come back to the university that they become uh, dismissed again. Do I have any uh, way of dealing with fundamentalists? Well, I would suggest, what, what is your, do you have a religious background? Uh, not currently. Yeah, well, whatever your, your comfortable background is, read about 100 books <laughs> in that tradition. You will never be a fundamentalist. <laughs> yeah. That's one. Yeah, this oh. Okay. Oh. Um, sure, okay. Uh, I think this actually gets at uh, what you were trying to ask as well. Um, so you mentioned that uh, religion must both begin and end in wonder, but that these belief systems are a very, very guttural response to fear. How is it that we avoid that fear? What is it that we have to do in order to keep the sense of wonder without giving into terror? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I, I, terror is, that's big. And, uh, I, I wish I had a solution. I, 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 honestly, I don't. I don't know why. I think, I, I mean, I'm impressed by the fact that it keeps happening, that religions keep throwing out belief systems. You know, by the way, it's even happening now in uh, religious traditions where it's not really occurred that much before. They're sort of getting westernized in a way. Hinduism, for example, is, is developing a kind of fundamentalist core, or shell, I would say. Uh, and uh, there are some Buddhists, too. And then there, there are strange things happening, like um, the Chinese are, are going back to pick up Confucius as a kind of official philosopher, uh, justifying, they think, they hope, the structure of the Chinese government. But, but I, uh, and, and all I'm saying is it's going to persist. And I, I don't know, uh, uh, really, uh, what to say about that. I wish I had an answer. I don't. Sorry. Uh, thanks for the talk. You mentioned that the, the study of comparative religions is something that is not very useful. What do you think about 
the sort of study that looks, as William James put it, for the more of the experience of religion. So well, sort of well, William is James a, is a terrifically interesting example. Uh, he, he, he had a religious moment. He got religious. Uh, his brother William didn't, but uh, I mean his brother James did. Wait, well Henry, Henry didn't, <laughs> uh, and uh, but but William did. And what he thought was that if he interviewed uh, truly religious people, that he would find some connection, some verifiable connection between them and the divine. Uh, it's a very famous study the, uh, uh, that, that he did. And that the, it was right at the end of the I think he published it in the year 1900, if I'm uh, correct. And, um, and, and he didn't. He didn't find anything. But he looked at every variety of human of religious experience and came up with a zero. And I think that I think that tells us a lot about the validity of human ex, of religious experience. Zero. It doesn't tell us anything about religion. Religion is not an experience. It is, it is one of these big, massive things plunging on through history full of crazy believers and mysteries and so on. Um, it's too big for an, uh, to be grasped in an experience. Anyway, that. Uh, do you think we should take his thesis as granted and not? So you, you assume that his conclusions are right, and so that there's no more to the mystical experience than what empirical, well, not in the classic empirical sense, but not in the empirical sense you can look at. Do you think that, so do you think that his study is somehow final? Uh, no, I don't think it's final, but, but he's not the only one to talk about it. So there, there, have, been, there have been a lot of definitions of religion. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead, uh, with a wonderful definition, said religion is what we do with our ordinariness. Or, and, and, I mean, with our uh, solitariness, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Tillich called uh, religion uh, a sense of the ultimate, uh, so, sort of the ultimate other. And... Uh, uh, then uh, uh, Schleiermacher, a big theologian in the early part of the 19th century, called it a sense of, uh, of, uh, absolute of, of what? Absolute dependence. Ab absolute dependence. Thank you. Yeah, right. And they just didn't work out. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're good. They're great. But, uh, but then when you look at them more carefully, they don't fit into a lot of the literature and so on. OK, sorry, but yeah. Oh. Hello. So today I think I learned a very crucial distinction between what a belief system is and a system of critical inquiry is. And Wait, I'm is sorry, say it again? Yeah. Uh, I think that today I learned a very critical distinction between what a belief system and a system of critical inquiry yeah. is. And this is quite relevant and distinctive to me because as somebody who comes from a city that used to be the center of the Catholic uh, mission in South America, <laughs> you have eight churches in the same avenue. And even if you are now 200 years after that, it's a still a highly religious society. However, what we are trying to do is to turn our economy into a knowledge economy that comes with uh, an increasing amount of effort and a more, an increased amount of uh, investment in science and technology. However, what I've noticed it is that the way some people in my country are approaching science is with the same way they would approach a belief system. Uh, so I wanted to ask about, is there any way we can prevent this confusion? Because... Well, yeah, uh, okay, wait, let me point out something that I didn't really say, but I could have. You, if you remember, this is all, uh, uh, the, the systems of uh, critical inquiry end up with a higher ignorance, guess what? So do the religions. There's a meeting, there's a kind of meeting point between religion and science in that respect. They don't overlap, they're not the same thing, but they're, they're compatible to, to each other when we look at them in those, in those terms. So they're very easy to be confused. Because my sense was that even persons that would be uh, like, 
persons that I know, my own ex-boyfriend, would be so religious about science, he would react, even though he oh. claims himself an atheist. So I was feeling that even though we are thinking differently, we just can't give up the old ways of Oh, I think that's definitely doing that. true. <laughs> so is there any way you can make this you know, uh, again, distinction uh, yeah, more clear? Re re reading. Read, read, read. Yeah. When, uh, when uh, uh, Adlai Stevenson's uh, nephew went to college, he wrote his uncle saying, Dear Uncle Adlai, uh, do you have any advice for me as a student in, uh, in college? And Adlai Stevenson wrote back a, a small card that just said, read, read, read. <laughs> okay. uh, that almost maybe partially answers my question, but uh, essentially what I'm uh, primarily studying is a, a way of turning a mechanical machine into a, a wise decision maker. Oh, AI? AI. Okay. Uh, and, and I guess my religion, uh, my question uh, sort of, <laughs> sort of wants to. Sorry, no, sorry, I got uh, sorry, it. Sorry, wants to answer uh, what an AI might perceive as a higher wisdom. Do you think it would be essentially an, um, forgive my genderism and ageism, but an old man on a mountain, or would it be a, a, a small baby who's just learning the first steps? Uh, who's constantly inquiring and has no presuppositions. I think when you, when you print it out at the end, it would look, the printout would take this shape. <laughs> I mean, I, that's not a joke. I mean that. I mean, if it's really wise, it's going to be, in the end, wondering. Still wondering. That's all. That's great. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot. I mean, to, to go through life wondering is one of the richest, most valuable things I could wish all of you. Answers, not as important. Wonder, absolute, uh, absolutely important. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Great. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, and secondly, I was wondering. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I'm wondering if you thought that the lack of consensus on these religious systems and figures was like would in, would encourage their continued popularity or discourage it. You know, I I, I wish I could answer that. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why why don't people just forget this guy Jesus? I mean, even atheists can't forget him. <laughs> uh, they they keep writing books about uh, you know how he's a fraud or one thing or another. Um, I did a little tally in one of my own books of all the Jesuses. Well, I, I, didn't, I couldn't get all of them. Uh, but the Jesuses that have shown up in the last uh, sort of century or so. And I don't know, there are 50 or 60 or 70 different Jesuses. And, uh, and figures who could have taken on a similar role? Or? I, I don't know. They, you know, it's so hard to figure out who the guy was originally. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. you don't know. But why? Okay, so shock him. You know, you could say that word a little differently, but, but, but on the other hand, you can't, you can't. He just keeps coming back. And, uh, it, or, you know, another, I'll tell you another way I like to think about it. Uh, if you know the old uh, New Testament, uh, what happens is Jesus is crucified. He's buried. Uh, a day or two later, three women, his mother, Mary, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and then two other Marys come, one, one woman uh, just known as Mary, we don't know her any other way, come to uh, uh, the tomb and the grave is empty. Now, my, my th one of my favorite easiest ways, sort of metaphorical ways of understanding Christianity is that it's a, a 2,000 year attempt to put the body back in the grave. <laughs> And uh, find the guy that fit into that grave. And what's, what's disastrous, I mean, what's hard about it is that the grave won't go away. And, and if, if you, if I were to give, uh, as I said, I, I've only taught the course in, in, history, in uh, history of Christian thought once, but I'm sure if you looked over Christian history, you would see an array of, of attempts to put that body back in there that are dizzying in their number and variety. Uh, it just is, it has proved to be impossible to find a Jesus who fits 
into what we know of the biblical record. Cool. Period. Yeah, I, I wish it were. No, I don't. No, I like it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I like it that way a lot. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so as you've mentioned, um, in the past 100 years or so, there have been belief systems that have been highly pathological. Um, I'm wondering if there are any systems of critical inquiry that could also be pathological. In that could be what? Also what? Pathological. pathological. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, the, uh, yeah, anything that ends up with an answer is dangerous. <laughs> I, no, I mean, I mean it. Yeah. Um, answers, look, you're in a university. The whole point of a university is to keep that mind working. Anytime it looks like you're coming to an end, start again. You know, work at it. Uh, stay, stay wondering. Uh, you're in the you're in the most privileged place imaginable for human beings, surrounded by books, scholars, people of wisdom, people full of crazy ideas and brilliant ideas, and so on. Uh, with discussion going in all directions. By the way, I have to say I'm very impressed with the a number of things with the intelligence of the questions that come, the passion, uh, my, my wife likes to point this out, she was very impressed with the passion of the students that we've met. That's terrific. You're in the right place. You've got the right answers, which is the question mark. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming again. Uh, so my question was just kind of referring to the anecdote you related about Martin Luther, about how he was visited by his own self-doubt. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, I get, my question is concerning self-doubt, and uh, I wonder oh. if uh, it's necessary to suspend self-doubt uh, in order to continue a project. So when you're really dedicated to a cause, do you need to suspend your self-doubt in order to keep going? Or is uh, No, you don't part? need to, but a lot of people do. Uh, you know, sure. once you... Uh, it's, it's a good thing to, it's a good way to keep an eye on yourself. Once you begin to think you know exactly what you're doing, go back into the inquiry mode mm -hmm. and uh, self, go, go back into self questioning. Um, so, uh, is that not paralysis? Or, like, how does one continue? No, 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 I don't think it is. I think it leads to, I, 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 th I think it leads to huge activity. Look, the, another thing about the religious tradition, especially the Christian, the, the Christian Jewish world, a little, it's also the Islamic world. Uh, this, I need a lot of qualifications here. I'll, I'll, I'll spare them. Uh, is that the curiosity, the, 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 the unknown quality that lies, that empty grave that lies there, developed a ferocious desire for knowledge. This led through the uh, great monasteries of the early Middle Ages and so on, uh, into the universities of Europe and into the universities of, uh, of America and Western Europe. Uh, and all of them, I mean, take the, the motto of, uh, of Yale, uh, Lux in, at Veritas, light and truth. And the, the, the motto of Harvard, truth, Veritas. They are looking for the truth. And, and at the, they were founded in a Christian tradition, in a Christian setting. Uh, that there's, there's, there's such a, a deep kind of unsettling mystery at the center of that tradition that it even develops huge universities, unlike any other tradition in the world. All the other great universities in the world or great institutions of learning are copies of the Christian tradition. I mean, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it, it, it sounds funny to say that, but I'm, I'm, I, I can, I can make my case. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, um, my question is, I guess, in the n nature of asking for just a little bit of clarification of what you are or are not um, advocating. To contextualize my question, my father would describe himself as a Christian theologian, and he has taught comparative religion. So he says, as you do, that in fact that project of trying to find the one underlying truth washed out. Right, they, right, they, they could right. not find one underlying find truth. It. However, the teaching of um, comparing religions, if you will, um, 
the study of world religions has certainly not gone away. And I think there seems to be some value in it in trying to understand different systems of belief and what people value in them. Um, John Verveke, um taught me um, about the idea that I guess was a Buddhist idea of internalizing the sage. And so then I just regarded Jesus as being one sage as another. So what I'm trying to clarify, you're, you advocated for somebody who's trying to avoid fundamentalism to go and read lots of books in your, yeah. in your, in your religion, tradition, just to, to shake up the idea that there's yeah. one right answer. But are you, um, are you saying don't bother writing any more books, or are you saying go ahead no. and write more books? No, no, no. Write, write as many as you can. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> just yeah. as long as you're I mean, there's a lot to be done yet. I, <laughs> I thought it was finished when I studied, but uh, <laughs> all right. I just wanted uh, to clarify. Sixty that. years later, I uh, know. Yeah. All right. Okay. Still thank going you. on. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry, I always forget. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you. Uh, Mentioned fundamentalism being a recent thing, 19th century only. Yeah, right. I was wondering part, uh, for, I wanted elaboration or clarification on this. In part, how are you defining fundamentalism? For example, before the 19th century, do you, like, would you be saying that people did not literally believe these doctrines or their strict belief was rather in the authority of the church instead of the book or uh, something else? Um, yeah. Like, were, were people not literalists, are you uh, saying? Or do you mean something else by fundamentalism? Yeah, well, here's, here's what happened. Uh, at, uh, w w it wasn't only Darwin, but Darwin was a big factor. Uh, suddenly, science became the big event, big popular, exciting thing in universities. One of the religious reactions was to read religious language like it was scientific language. They didn't. They couldn't make the distinction between two modes of discourse. And so then they found they had to decide which one they wanted. They didn't see the connections or the, or the distinctions in any uh, interesting way. And that's, what that's where I think what modern fundamentalism is. It's a, it's a way of reading the text like it's a scientific uh, document. As you, as the, um, I wonder, I, it feels to me that the distinction is even a new one. If I claim that the, if, for example, I claim that the Earth is 6,000 years old, that sort of way of talking about the age of things in general is not just a like formal, theoretical, highly abstract, like, or it is highly abstract, but <laughs> um, it's the normal way of talking about normal things. And do you think that 2,000 years ago, people did not interpret it in this normal, everyday sense if they said the Earth was 6,000 years old? Um. I need a semester for that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very big question. I, I, uh, I, the answer is yes, basically. Yes, that they did or didn't? I mean, they, they, <laughs> they, they, they used, look, we can do it like this. Let's say you're a Talmudic Jew. You could, uh, you could sit down. Uh, and you're also a scientist. You, you sit down, you, you, go, you go work on the Talmud in the evening, you go to your job in the physics lab in the morning. Now, if you were to jump back uh, 2,000 years, you could keep the conversation going in the same way. It's a conversation that started back then and still continues. Just a word about the nature of conversation. One way to understand these traditions is to understand them as conversations. And here, here's, here's why I say that. You go up to two people who are wrapped in talk, uh, deep talk with each other, and you say to, say to them, what are you talking about? And one person says, well, this is what we're talking about. And the other person says, that's what she thinks we're talking about. And we're talking about something else. And then a third person joins. And and as long as no one knows what the conversation is about, it will continue. <laughs> and as soon as everyone knows, it's over. So great conversations are never know what they're about. 
we don't know what we're talking about. Christians don't know what they're saying, uh, literally, right? And, and so when you, when you go back to that, so I mean, it would be the same thing here as there. So there's, there, it doesn't change in that, in that respect. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just so answer. Back to that question, back to that question, then we'll have some answers. So okay. Oh, yeah, very, yeah, okay. Very concise oh, yeah, that's good. You mentioned that, uh, in particular, the Christian mystery um, was responsible for the outspurting of universities. Do you think that? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, okay, okay, yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, so do you think that, um, in extension to that, the, the Christian mystery was responsible for the for the rise of science? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I guess my question, I'll ask it two ways, but it's the same thing. If we start in wonder with religion and end in wonder, why bother spewing out all the like belief systems in the middle? And sort of with the analogy to science, it seems like with science, you sort of think you're making progress, even though you know that it's no, always fallible. Yeah. But in religion, do people think they're making progress or what motivates that to continue? Uh, okay, one more. Yeah, okay. Huh? All right, uh, this might be very anticlimactic, but when you say uh, that there's no way we can know what Jesus was, do you mean that none of the reconstructions of Jesus' life historically are such that they would fit all the facts, there's no contradictions, just that there's such a huge set of them that there's no real way to distinguish which one of these possible ones is the right one? The la latter. All right, sure, thanks. Yeah. I was hoping. And uh, I, I'll, I'll just say this. Oh, okay, what? Uh, I'm going to make I'm going to make one one comment. Uh, God, I don't know. It must have been 60 years ago, maybe, or something like that. I was happened to be at that time at the University of North Carolina. Who should speak there but Robert Oppenheimer? He was given, you know, one of the uh, the great greatest scientists of the uh, 20th century. He was given an honorary degree, and I was honored to be in the audience when, when he spoke. He was in a tux. It was very dramatic. It was a stage, and the spotlight was on him. It was theatrical as hell. And he, he talked away for a while. And then he went into the silence. And he said, no one will ever know what it was like for me to stand at the edge of knowledge and look into the darkness. He said that. And I thought, my education's been a success. <laughs> I, I loved it. That was great. And, uh, and that's the kind of metaphor I have for, I mean, he was one of the most learned scientists or human beings. I mean, he knew all kinds of stuff. A brilliant, brilliant man. And what attracted him was the darkness. Uh, the, what, what's, what, what's the word, imponderability? No, what was the word you used, uh, uh, Jordan, about the unlikelihood or something that draws people on? <laughs> the uh, imperturbability, whatever it was, that something makes people think and draws them forward. The unknown. The unknown, that's good enough. Yeah, okay, good. We'll end on the unknown. All right. Okay. All right.